make sure Linux screen sharing actually works. It's a miracle. All right. And we are now recording. All right. And it's five minute past, so uh, I think we can get this kicked off. I don't know if uh, BHS is on the call and I'm wants here, to be here. Yeah, I, you want me to do a quick intro to Todd? Yeah, I, let's let's start it off that way. Cool. Yeah. So uh, Todd Lipcon is, uh, I guess you know Todd does a lot of different stuff, but he's the um, uh, the lead for the Kudu project, uh, the Apache Kudu project, which is a pretty interesting uh, data store that um, is a column oriented combination of uh, it's kind of like a chimera of, of different storage systems. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful actually, and and uh, he's done some incredible performance work, uh, making it work on a, a variety of different workloads. Which um, I'm excited to see him present here today. Uh, he's also a committer for a long list of other uh, Apache projects and incredibly well respected in that community. So um, I'm I'm really excited to hear his talk. And uh, you know, I don't have too much more of an intro aside from that, but that's a portrait. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, so yeah, I didn't prepare a whole lot. Ben said this is usually a pretty laid back, relaxed call. So I just threw together a few slides starting about 20 minutes ago. So I apologize for the lack of, of polish here. Um, also, feel free to jump in. I don't know how many folks are on the call, but if someone wants to jump in and kind of guide the conversation to stuff that you all find interesting, that's fine by me. Um, so I do have a couple of slides and I also just wanted to show a couple of things live. I guess we've got about 25 more minutes before you got to get on to other stuff. Um, as ben you, can, you, can go the, over, you can go over if you need to, Todd, that's fine. Okay. This is probably more interesting than whatever we'll talk about next. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll play it by ear then. Um, so I got plenty of time. So yeah, 30 second intro to Kudu, I guess Ben already kind of covered it. It's a distributed column store. Um, for those of you who aren't database people, column stores basically uh, organize the data that you store in them. Um, sort of in a column-oriented manner so that each column is stored together. And when you want to scan just one column out of, say, 100 columns in your table, you can do so without having to waste the I.O. reading all the others, which makes it very well suited for analytics. Uh, one thing that we did in Kudu, though, is try to actually make this also efficient for random access. Um, so while Kudu is typically used for analytics, we do have some use cases that are pretty random access oriented, and we do run some benchmarks using the more NoSQL random access um, style benchmarking tools like YCSB. That people might be familiar with. Uh, it's also a distributed system, so we use Raft for replication. Uh, I imagine people here probably know about Raft, so it's basically another implementation of consensus, very similar to multi -taxis. Um So we do care about latency. Uh, I wouldn't say that latency is our number one concern. We're not typically running a directly web-facing properties off Kudu, uh, but we do usually have end users who are on some BI tool and they expect queries to come back sub-second. Um, and oftentimes that sub-second query actually boils down to hundreds or thousands of requests underneath. Uh, so the, the tail latency is actually pretty important, where one tail outlier at the 99th percentile actually tends to dominate a lot of workloads. I think people here probably are familiar with that whole idea. Um, there's a the great paper that I really like called Tail at Scale from Google maybe six or eight years ago. Uh, if you haven't read that, you definitely should if you're working in tracing. Um, I don't want to talk too much about Kudu, though. I think the way that we approach building Kudu is essentially to build a bunch of kind of generic systems infrastructure. Um, people who work at companies like Google or Uber probably have a lot of this stuff already in-house, not open source. Unfortunately, we started from scratch on a lot of this stuff. Um, so we built a lot of these things that probably seem familiar to people from either other companies or other ecosystems uh, that are pretty generic to any distributed system software that cares about this kind of stuff. So I think most of the stuff, you don't need to know anything about what Kudu does. Just think of this as a platform for building high-performance, low-latency system software. Um, so I'm going to jump right into some of the various things. This is kind of like a, a grab bag talk. It's not like there's one arc or story to this. Uh, just kind of here are the various things we do, uh, what we found to be useful. Um, so the first one is pretty simple, request scope tracing. This is probably the thing we do that's most similar to open tracing, where we have a, uh, by the way, Kudu is almost all in C++, so all this talk is about our C++ backend. Uh, we've got a macro called trace. Uh, it takes a little substitution string with dollar sign uh, placeholders. Um, and pretty much every RPC starts a new trace, and we can pass it between threads, uh, and then the tracing just sort of gets appended to whatever the current trace is. Um, this is not actually a hierarchical trace. It's not really Dapper or open tracing style. It's really just a log. Uh, and when we accumulate this log uh, associated with an RPC, we sample it, 
So we have different sampling buckets for different latency profiles. And also, we, we actually have uh, timeouts propagated from clients. So whenever a client sends an RPC, it says, hey, my timeout is one second. And on the back end, if we realize that we responded to that RPC after one second, we'll always dump the trace of that RPC. So it gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening on the RPCs that are too long. Um, very, very simplistic, but it, you know, again, it took like you know, two hours to write, whereas open tracing is a much more complicated thing. Um, and it's super, super lightweight. There's no infrastructure. It's all in process. We don't need to hook up to any collectors, anything like that. Uh, so it's limited in scope. Um, I mean that both in the computer science sense of the word scope and also in the uh, how much it accomplishes, but it's been very, very useful for us. Um, one thing actually I didn't put in the slides is we also have for each of these traces a very simple map of counters. So if you look at an RPC trace, we'll have the log, and then we'll also have a bunch of counters. Some of them are pretty generic, so our spin lock implementation will count how many cycles were spent spinning and attribute that to the RPC. Um, and then we also have a lot more specific to the particular request. So if you're doing a write, we have to write to the write ahead log. Any amount of time we spent uh, waiting to write to the write ahead log becomes a counter on that trace. I'll show some examples in, in just a minute. Um, actually, why don't I do it in line and show examples while I talk? Uh, so okay, I have another browser here. Um, so here's a server I just started running on localhost. I'm showing the RPC Z page, uh, which shows the running RPCs and sampled RPCs, but I've never made any RPCs to this server yet. Uh, so there's nothing in there. Um, but if I go to my little Python shell over here and call list tables, there's no tables in this cluster because I just started it. Um, but that would have made an RPC. So if I, res I reload this page, I can see the current uh, RPC connections that are open, uh, where it's from, the state. If there were an RPC currently running, it would show up in this inbound connections list. And then we can see a sampled RPC trace. So the trace here, unfortunately, my browser doesn't show the new lines. Um, but you can see the time that it arrived. Um, how many microseconds it took, you know, coming onto the call queue, coming off the call queue, uh, handling, and then 220 uh, microseconds later, QA and success response. I think this is a debug build, so all the times are much slower than you normally expect. Um, <coughs> in a release build, this probably would take, you know, a few microseconds, not uh, however many this took, is 600 microseconds. Uh, so this is very simple. You know, if I do a bunch of these calls, uh, probably all of them are going to fall into the same bucket, so we're not going to actually see this change. Uh, but we resample once a second. Uh, if I go to a, actually one of our production servers uh, for an internal use case here at Cloudera, and I check out RPCZ, we can see there's a lot more going on. Um, there's a bunch of connections open from a lot of different hosts. Um, in fact, there's one call that's currently in flight, and you can see that the, the client sent a three-minute timeout on this. This is a scan call. Um, so far, it's been running for 11 milliseconds. Um, lots of information about outbound RPCs because the servers talk to each other. Uh, so this server has an outbound RPC to another server calling update consensus. You can see it sent the call, hasn't yet received a response. Um, if I go down to look at some of the more interesting things, we can see here a start tablet copy, which is one of our re-replication RPCs, and the whole information about what happened. Um, and then here's the metrics that I mentioned, that every RPC has various metrics. Some of them are pretty generic, so our I.O. code will account these metrics like F-Data Sync, um, how many we did, how many microseconds they took, how many microseconds we spent waiting on, um, mutexes, DNS, for some reason this request started a thread, how long it took to start the thread. Uh, every thread pool that we use has queue time uh, and runtime, uh, as well as CPU runtime. I don't know why they're not in alphabetical order here, but uh, so that we have a, a thread pool that's called raft and a thread pool called tablet copy that this request used. So we can see this tablet copy thread took quite a long time. Um, this is actually downloading a bunch of data from another server. So it's a, a longer request. Um, this is one particular sample uh, that took 82 milliseconds. But if we scroll down, you can actually see there's another sample of the same RPC that took longer. And if we're lucky, we might even have an example of a very long one. Uh, this is pretty useful to find out like what are the outliers? What happened in an outlier that was different from other outliers? Um, you know, maybe it's the update thing, maybe it's mutex time. Um, and you can go through and see all the different RPCs that we do. Uh, so that's sort of the simple RPC tracing that we do. Uh, another thing that I really like is that I found that oftentimes a single RPC trace won't tell you a whole lot. It'll tell you, hey, this RPC took a long time waiting on a lock or took a long time waiting on I.O. But you don't really know what happened that actually caused that. It's some cross-request interaction. 
So we separately have an infrastructure called process-wide tracing. Um, unfortunately, they're not really integrated. They were implemented separately and never really um, changed to use the same annotations or anything. Uh, but basically, these are mostly scoped annotations, and there's a way to actually draw an arc between two scopes as well. So if there's an async event fired in one place and picked up another place. And uh, essentially, you have a category for each trace event, some human readable name, and then some set of variables. Uh, and again, this is super low overhead when it's not on. And then you actually enable this when it's on. There's pretty high overhead when it's on because we have a lot of these trace scopes. Uh, so I'll pop over to um, this server I have here and go to tracing.html and hit record. And you can see there's a bunch of different categories we have. Um, this is the category that are in that trace annotation. So I'm going to say record. And then I'll make a couple RPCs to this server. And then stop. Uh, Fortunately, it doesn't look great when I'm zoomed way in for the uh, for the screen share. But you can see on the top, there's a timeline of CPU usage, and then various threads down the left. Um, you can see that one RPC worker was actually involved. Uh, I think I called request I called list tables uh, four times. So you can see one, two, three, four. And if I zoom way in here, uh, I can actually see the timeline that this call uh, started here. Uh, method list tables. It got picked up on this reactor thread, which is our network. Um, we use libbv for uh, network event-based I/O. It did the parsing of the protobuf. Um, if I turn on the flow events, I think we'll see. Actually, I think the new version of the browser doesn't support these, but it should actually draw an arrow here from here to here, showing that the the call was parsed here and picked up um, by a different thread. And you can see it actually includes in this trace. The traces that we just looked at. So you can see uh, when it was picked up, when it was handled, uh, what the metrics were. In this case, it's a pretty uninteresting call of no metrics. Uh, and then responding success. Uh, so this is, again, not a super interesting RPC. It's just a list of tables. Um, but if I go to the tracing page of one of our production servers uh, and record, it should actually fill up the buffer quite quickly. Uh, I'll capture a couple seconds. And you can see there's a lot more going on, uh, a lot more threads, uh, a lot more RPCs going on, and there's actually some RPCs that are taking pretty long. So if I click on the scan, I can see that it took uh, 705 milliseconds, and I might be able to zoom in and see this is continuing a scan, meaning that it started in the previous RPC. Uh, it's reading some blocks. It got a cache miss. Um, that's probably going to be blocking on I/O. Um, so this gives you a pretty good idea of what might be going on. You can zoom in and really see at the fine grain level. Uh, here's a cache miss. This one is pretty quick. It probably hit the OS buffer cache, whereas that one that was pretty long is probably um, actually going to disk. This took 12 milliseconds. It's probably hitting a spinning disk. Um, this is all very useful because you can actually see kind of cross request when one thing might actually be causing an impact on another. Uh, we're also able to see pretty interesting patterns in terms of our thread pools where we used to not have a LIFO order to our thread pools. So we'd round robin across all of our workers, and we wouldn't get this kind of nice chunking where only a, a small handful of RPC workers is active. It would actually be round robining across 100 threads and uh, really hurting the cache performance and things like that. Uh, so this has been very, very useful for us to find process-wide lockups. Uh, we found some issues with TC malloc, for example. Um, we've seen some issues with the Linux kernel where the MMAP semaphore gets held and then all the other threads block for apparently no reason. Uh, but they're actually they're all blocked on the lock in the kernel. Uh, but I found this to be very useful. It's way more information than you'd actually get from something like open tracing, and it, it captures the cross request. Uh, so I think things like open tracing are useful to pinpoint, hey, the server has high latencies, but when you actually want to dig into what's going on on that server, uh, this can be more useful. Uh, another nice feature of this, this is actually the trace viewer that's built into Chrome. Um, so I can type save here. I can actually save a JSON file. And uh, we often are deploying a customer site on premises, and they can make these JSON files and attach it to a support ticket. Um, and then I can load it into any other Kudu server, or even in Chrome, I can just go to About Tracing uh, and then load the wherever that JSON file went, um, and it'll load in and display on anyone's Chrome browser. Um, in fact, it might even display a little bit nicer because it's probably a newer version than we've embedded in Kudu itself. Uh, so that's the process-wide tracing.
Um, in terms of inner process tracing, we actually haven't had a big need yet. We don't have a lot of super deep RPC call stacks, uh, at least within Kudu. I think there's some cases where a user application, if they're building like a website, they might want to do tracing, in which case we want to support it for the consumers. Uh, but in terms of Kudu itself, when we get a request, our request is going to maybe wait on one other uh, server for replication, but that's about it. So we don't really, we haven't had a big impetus to go and do open tracing or Dapper or, or sorry, or Zipkin or um, Jaeger or anything like that. Uh, I also wanted to call out the unreasonable effectiveness of log statements. So we have this really stupid macro that I probably wrote on the first week when I started writing Kudu, which is scope log flow execution. So you pass a number of milliseconds and then some string. And this just checks if this particular scope that you put it in takes more than that number of milliseconds, it'll log out a statement saying, hey, I took a long time to do X. Uh, this is incredibly useful in customer environments when they, they kind of call up and they say, hey, Kudu is being a little bit slow. We say, well, well why is it slow? Is it IO bound? Like, I don't know. Here's some logs, figure it out. Uh, and just having these kind of markers in the logs that say, hey, look, writing to the right ahead log, a bunch of threads log this thing saying that it took a long time to write to the right ahead log uh, is, is a good pointer that maybe your right ahead log disk is slow or overly contended by other applications and things like that. Uh, so it's super simple, but pretty useful for the amount of effort it took. So we just have these sprinkled around our code base in various interesting places. Uh, a newer thing that we've added is process-wide stack trace collection. So we have a thing called the diagnostics log now. Uh, I think I can probably try to show you that. Um, so just by default, we run with this diagnostics log, uh, which gets put in the log directory. In this case, it's a dev build system temp. Um, so if I look at that file, it's semi-human readable. Uh, and basically, you get stack trace records. Um, which are by default once a minute uh, with some jitter, so we don't actually correlate with any kind of scheduled once a minute task. Um, so this one is 45 seconds apart, this one is another 45, this one is a little longer. Uh, and then in order to make it a little bit smaller, we do a little bit of um, dictionary encoding of the, the symbols. So you'll see here in the stack trace line, the stacks just have hex addresses. And then interleave, there's these symbols lines which map those hex addresses to particular um, particular symbols and function names. Um, the other type of info we put in these logs is metrics dumps. So we have a lot of metrics that are captured uh, from the server, histograms, counters, things like that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we found that even though customers may have centralized metrics collection, oftentimes those do a lot of downsampling or aggregation, and it's hard to get down to what happened at this exact minute or in between these two exact minutes, uh, what was the 99th percentile log append latency on this particular server? Uh, I think the best companies in the world probably can answer that question. Uh, most companies can't. And if you just have this really dumb gzip log and var log that you can get from the customer and look at this, uh, we have various tools we can take these logs and graph them um, and calculate various derived metrics. Uh, that's been super useful. Uh, again, it's kind of the, the simple thing, um, but works pretty well. And we've got a script uh, called diagnose parse stacks, I think it's called. Um, so if I run parse stacks on this log, uh, it'll print out a lot more information. So the stacks, and it does the symbolization, shows it by thread, um, groups together threads that are all having the same stack. So we have four reactor threads that are running libv event loops, and it groups them together in this. So it's a lot easier to understand what's going on there. Uh, versus seeing hundreds of threads all with the same stack. Uh, so I mentioned these are periodic. We also have triggered collections. So we have RPC queues where when an RPC hits the system, it goes into a queue waiting to be handled by a handler thread. And we have a pretty tight limit on the length of that queue. Uh, and if something arrives and it doesn't fit in that queue, we'll evict an RPC from that queue based on priority, uh, send back a message saying it needs to come back later, um, essentially doing back pressure on the clients by that mechanism. And when we actually do evict stuff from the queue, we trigger uh, at that point a stack trace of all the threads. This has been very, very useful for us finding reasons why something is locked up. So there's some set of uh, underlying lock that gets held. Maybe it's a logging issue or a kernel issue or something like that. And then very quickly the RPC queues back up and then it triggers a stack trace. So we have this smoking gun snapshot of here are all the threads, here where they're all blocked. And pretty quickly we can point out these issues. Uh, so techniques like this have allowed us to find issues like um, in glog, for example, if you just use the Google logging library in its default mode, uh, 
there is a mutex around logging, and that mutex can be held while it's actually doing the I.O., and the I.O. can take a long time. Um, so we've seen these issues where all the threads end up locked on glog. So we moved that to async logging, and those things got a lot better. Um, so these kind of techniques, again, pretty simple, but work really well. Uh, the stack traces are also viewable on a slash stacks webpage. Um, again, unreasonably effective, simple thing. Um, so if I go to one of our production servers, go to slash stacks, it's pretty quick. Um, and I call this kind of a poor man's profile also, if I'm curious what a workload is doing. Is it scan heavy? Is it doing a lot of IO? Is it uh, wasting a lot of CPU on something? Um, usually just a couple of reloads of this page, it gives you a pretty good idea of how busy the server is and what might be some bottlenecks. Uh, so it's interesting to me to see a hash table look up um, on the serialized roadblock call. This is actually a known performance issue that we've since, I think, fixed. Um, so very poor man's profiling. I reloaded again. I also see the standard hash table find here on this call. It's like, hmm, that probably shouldn't be in that call. We should have something a little faster there. All right. Uh, so slash metrics is Pretty simple, it's a lot of metric stuff. We built our own metric subsystem. We couldn't really find much good for C++. I think now the, maybe the census project is trying to do a little bit with this, um, but we implemented the HDR histogram um, uh, data structure for high resolution histograms. And all of our RPCs, as well as a bunch of other things throughout the code base, uh, track the latency histograms. Um, so you can see in this example that this particular write RPC um, has two significant digits of precision. We've done some number of them, uh, you know, mean and all the percentiles. Uh, and these actually keep the raw bucket counts as well underneath. So you can fetch it from slash metrics if you add a special query parameter, and they end up in that metrics log. So given the metrics log and given snapshots of the raw bucket counts, you can actually say between any two points in time, uh, what are the 99 percentiles of a bunch of different things? And we, we calculate it uh, on the server level as well as in individual tablets. And you can actually aggregate those raw bucket counts across tablets to say, what's the 99th percentile for this particular table? Uh, that's very useful for us as well to understand where the bottlenecks might be or where slowness might be coming from. Uh, another fun thing we built a couple of years ago that found a lot of interesting issues is the stack watchdog. Uh, so on important threads, so things like, for example, the write ahead log append, we use this scope watch stack. Uh, we give some number of milliseconds that so we expect it should not take more than 500 milliseconds to append to the wall. And then there's some background thread, which is the watchdog thread, uh, which essentially scans a registry of all the other threads and does a kind of lock-free check to see if any of these threads is inside one of these particular scope watch stack scopes. And if anybody's been inside one of those scopes for longer than the amount of time that's expected, it'll actually take the stack trace of that target thread and dump it to the log. Uh, there's some rate limiting to make sure that things don't go crazy in the logging. Um, it's been super useful to find various issues with um, at the file system level or uh, glog or uh, TC malloc. It's another case we found some bugs there. Um, so in this case, the write ahead log uh, at this line of code was stuck for 600 milliseconds, and it takes the kernel stack as well. So we can actually see that inside the kernel, it was waiting on JB JBD2, which is the, um, the, the file system journal we need to get right access to the file system journal. Um, so this is something that, you know, you probably would expect for write-ahead log. The fact that you had to wait for 600 milliseconds is a little bit unexpected. So maybe that disk is either going bad or just overloaded. Um, in fact, it turns out that this is just due to Red Hat Enterprise 6 being really old and pretty bad implementation of a lot of this stuff. Uh, so you can also see the user stack is in do write v, which kind of makes sense because the kernel stack is in the, the write v system call. Um, so I think that's all the slides that I prepared. I didn't want to go too long. I figured questions and discussion is more interesting. Um, is there anything that people want to hear more about or curious to see how the code works or anything like that? I've got a question. Um, thanks, Todd. This is pretty interesting. And I've, it's fun to see. I kind of knew that you would do this, which is why I wanted you to do this. But it's nice to see a presentation about performance analysis and stuff like that that's not just like 100% about distributed tracing because these other techniques are really interesting and relevant. But one thing that comes up uh, in my head, I think actually this is a fine example. It sounds like in this case, it was um, the issue had to do with Red Hat Enterprise 6 not being a very good implementation. But a lot of the things that you're probably dealing with have to do with contention, 
uh, for some shared resource, whether it's the disk or something else. And I'm, I'm curious, like what, you know, um, do you have techniques that you're using to understand the uh, source of load when there's just an, you know contention issues, overloaded resource, that type of thing? Like, what what are you typically doing to find the multiple writers or whatever it is that's contending for a resource? Yeah, we don't have any super generic things for that. Um, I think specifically for lock contention, our spin locks are instrumented with. Um, I probably should have talked about that here. Our spin locks have some instrumentation where they collect the stack trace uh, of the uh, unlocking node, when it unlocks, it sees that there was a waiter and collects its stack trace. So it kind of knows which holders uh, were causing contention of somebody else. Um, and then we expose that through the pprof web interface. Um, so I'll see if I can actually um, show that. Yeah. So. If I go to the special URL, which can be read via the Go pprof tool as well, um, it'll tell us over this one second uh, the various stack traces where we had some contention. Um, and these can be symbolized if you have the binary as well. Uh, so this is super useful for the generic kind of spin lock contention. It won't tell us exactly, like it tells us the stack trace and the memory address, but that doesn't tell us what kind of uh, application level object was contended. Uh, but it's usually fairly clear once you get this data that okay, at least I need to zero in on that part of the code to understand where the spin lock contention is going. Um, similarly, you can get CPU profile from this kind of endpoint. Um, honestly, I find the slash stacks to be unreasonably useful for this kind of thing as well. Uh, so one interesting example is maybe six months ago, we learned that TC malloc, which is the allocator we use, has um, sort of fixed free lists for all sizes less than one megabyte allocations. Uh, but one megabyte and above uh, actually goes to like a central span list, um, which was actually implemented as a linked list until very recently. So just by looking at the slash stacks profile, we thought, why are half of our threads in TC malloc allocate large uh, iterating of our linked list? Just in the stack traces, you can see that. And then by digging into the code, we realized that what we thought was a less than or equal to one megabyte was actually a less than one megabyte. And all of our arena allocators have been tuned to get one megabyte allocations. Um, so by changing that down from one megabyte to a little bit less than one megabyte, we got rid of a bunch of latency outliers. It's kind of like this very stupid thing where we went to like 1,020 kilobytes or something. Um, and then we also submitted some patches upstream to TC Malloc to actually cache the one megabyte allocations and to make the central free list, not use a linked list and use a tree instead. Uh, and those two changes actually increased the throughput on some workloads which did a lot of larger allocations by like 40, 50%. Um, so it all kind of started from seeing something strange and just some stack traces. And then from there, we, we did the next level of digging to actually understand what was going on. Awesome, thanks. I, I got a question actually. Um, first of all, a uh, great presentation. Uh, it's awesome to see all these details. Uh, one thing that that comes up a lot is you've got all these different tools for for looking at instrumenting various parts of your system, kernel level stuff, stacks, threads, uh, user logs, and where some of the trickiness shows up a lot of the times is sort of figuring out the right granularity of it, in order for these things to be relevant, you often have to sort of staple them together somewhere, and that act of yeah. stapling them together itself has overhead and that often seems to come up as like the trickiest part. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that or could, you know, relay an experience report with trying to figure that part out. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we have a lot of systems that are useful in the right hands, but hard to expose what you should be looking at. Um, so we're trying to document things better. We're starting some run books for our internal support team to understand like how these things might be useful. Um, in terms of like correlating oh, I saw one outlier, but I wasn't collecting the traces at that time. Yeah, we definitely have that. Um, you kind of have to like hope that you catch the thing happening that you wanted to see. Uh, so it's a little hard. That's why we started to add more of these features like the diagnostic plug that's just always taking stacks and that's now on by default. Um, you know, it took us a little bit of nervousness to be like, eh, is it actually safe to have this thing taking stack traces once a minute? Um, because when we first implemented it, we actually found deadlocks in the dynamic loader. If you try to stack trace a thread while it's in the loader, and we have awful workarounds to try to prevent that. Uh, so I think there's always risk when you add this instrumentation, either performance or bugs. 
I remember actually the first time we added the contention profiling, I introduced this awful memory correction bug where I was writing outside of the stack. Um, and that almost got released to customers and that would have been really bad because we had a lot of crashes and things like that. Uh, so there's always risk. And I think for us, it's okay to have even like a five or 10% um, performance reduction. I think our, our customers are not so performance sensitive and they're a lot more sensitive if stuff is down and they don't know why or stuff is performing badly and they don't know why. And it takes us, you know, if it takes us three weeks to understand what the performance problem is, they'll be a lot more upset versus if we say, well, you've got a 5% overhead, but we can pinpoint that problem in an hour instead of three weeks. Um, it's usually a good trade-off for us. It's probably not the case for every company, uh, but we tend to, to lean more towards that side of the spectrum, I guess. I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but that's sort of our philosophy. Yeah, yeah that, that is sort of it uh, around uh, there's, well, one, trying to figure out the right granularity often seems to be part of the trick beyond it being potentially dangerous. You know, the, yeah. there's some, there's always some overhead that comes with this stuff. And sometimes it just seems, uh, especially writing databases, C++ stuff, people can be very, very obsessive about maximal efficiency. And then you're saying yeah. like, ah, oh, we're, we're just going to add 5% overhead to figure out what's wrong with it. It's almost like a, like a cultural issue that sometimes you, you yeah. have to convince people that it, that it's, it's worth it. Um, yeah. I think the, the best example I can give there is like, yeah, we always have a 5% overhead, but this 5% overhead has allowed us to pinpoint performance issues that have saved us 40 or 50%. <laughs> like we've gotten huge gains from things we found using this infrastructure. So if we never added this 4%, we'd still be stuck way back in you know, a year ago and it was much, much slower. So you have to spend a little to, to win a lot. Cool, great. Um, I guess one last thing that I didn't show is uh, the heat profile, which is another thing we've turned on more recently. Uh, oh, it's not even on on this server because we turned it on so recently. Um, but the TCML and keep sampling is one of these things that's not really well advertised. It's quite low overhead. And I think probably for our next release, we're going to turn it on by default. Um, we have a lot of our own kind of internal memory tracking to understand where our memory is going. But sometimes we have this case where the customer is like, your internal memory tracking says you're using three gigs of memory, but like the RSS according to top is 16 gigs. Where did it all go? And we don't really have any clue usually, uh, but with turning on the heap sampling thing, even though, again, it might be a 1% overhead, uh, we'll be able to answer those questions a lot better. And when we first turned it on, started looking at some workloads with it, we found huge wins that were like, hey, why are we storing that thing? We don't even use that thing. And we remove it and save you know, 8 megabytes here, 16 megabytes there, and it adds up. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Any other questions for Todd? Looks like that was it, but that was a really great, great presentation. And we'll chop this up and put this on the web, uh, Todd, for other people uh, who are interested in Kudu uh, to check great. out. Definitely seems if you're using Kudu, like this is like a great rundown of all the things you can do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most advanced users probably find use. I think a lot of users probably don't want to care about this stuff and just hope it works. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we certainly use it on the dev team a lot. Um, also, if anybody has any further questions, feel free to. I'm on the Gitter, uh, the Open Tracing Gitter, so feel free to ping me there, and I'll I'll check in later today. Awesome, thank you, thank you so much. Right. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me, Ben. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you. So, wait. Okay. So. Uh, Back to our, our regularly scheduled programming. We've got a couple things on the uh, agenda around uh, open tracing API uh, questions. Um, first one, someone put on here, uh, trace ID, span ID, how do we make a decision to proceed? Uh, is that Yuri? Yeah. Yeah. What's the question? So I, I don't remember what's the status of the spec RFC for this one, but definitely uh, there's a lot of people keep asking and trying to open PRs uh, in different language repos, so. Um. Yeah, I think we should just get moving on it. I know just like 
with my team, we've been really focused on getting the scope and scope manager release for Python out the door. Uh, and so we haven't felt like we've personally had bandwidth to, to also um, release and manage this in other languages while that's going on. Um, so that's honestly probably the holdup. Uh, Python's supposed to go out this week. Uh, there's some final uh, little back and forth about uh, naming conventions, but uh, people in general seem satisfied with that API. So my plan was as soon as that was out to start pushing on span and trace ID. Um, so I guess my, my question is, uh, are we okay with breaking the API in this case? Um, because it will be a breaking change in many languages, right? It's definitely in Go. Uh, and it may, con like, it may clash with uh, existing tracers already implementing those methods, but potentially with different return types. Yeah. So I would say that there's like two issues there. One, it, it's a breaking change for tracing implementers. Um, but not a breaking change, uh, but it's, it's a breaking change that's backwards compatible. So you now have to expose these on your tracer and issue a, a new version of your tracer, but that tracer will conform to the older API. So it's not like you need to fork and maintain two versions. And for users of the code, it's not a breaking change at all because it's simply an additive method. So in that sense, I think everyone's fine uh, with it being a breaking change um, because it's it's more of just a an, an minor update as opposed to a major break. Uh, the other issue that, that's maybe more serious or, or harder to see is around naming these methods. Should they be called trace ID and span ID or trace identifier and span identifier, which is a big mouthful, but uh, definitely limits the chances of a collision with a pre-existing uh, pre method that returns something else. We've seen one example of that, which is the mock tracer, it has trace ID and span ID, and it returns like a UN. <clears throat> but uh, we've been asking around actual implementers, and no one with a tracer currently binding to open tracing has spoken up and said, no, that won't work. So I think that's really the the final bike shed there. There's been a lot of push from everyone to be like trace ID and span ID are nice names. Let's and it doesn't seem to mess up any real code. So let's do it. Uh, I am a little um, nervous that someone not, will show up <laughs> too late and say, "Hey, this messed with me." It's not quite non-breaking change because uh, in the absence of these APIs today, people do cast. Uh, to concrete implementations and use those existing methods, which may be returning different types. So the, the end user code will be affected. So the, it's just a, if you're casting, I don't, the only case where this is potentially a breaking change would be if you literally had the method trace ID and span ID with the same capitalization and everything else. Yeah, um, which most, most tracers had, I think. Well, that that's that's been the question asking around like who literally has this method signature that returns something else and and no one has spoken up saying that they do the the other answer is just to name it something slightly different right i think that that's the final question that has to get resolved if you call it just a slightly different name um then you massively reduce the chance of there being a collision yeah. so no one called it trace identifier because that's really long to type. It's just you now have this API we're asking everyone to use and it's and it's got a funky method signature as a result of this. So really maybe it's like can we do a more exhaustive uh, audit of existing tracers that bind to open tracing and really get an active confirmation that it will or will not be a problem. Well, as far as Jaeger, every single library in Jaeger had a trace ID and span ID in the most uh, idiomatic form for the language, right? So in, in Go, it would be like upper ID, etc. So oh. you're definitely going to have clash. And they would return like native types rather than strings. Well, why don't you say something, man? We've just I did not talking... see that, that question anywhere. Oh. Uh, but <laughs> you said like Mock Tracer had the same thing, and I would assume most of the traces had the same thing. Yeah. 
Well, then it's just a matter of, of calling it, um, just calling it something else. Uh, I think that's, that's the solution. Um, maybe something that's not as long as identifier for people who have to type this out manually, that's hard to remember how to spell and very long. So I, I really think that's, that's what we need. Um, span key, trace key. I'm fine with identifier myself, but yeah, I mean, good completion. Seriously, who types this stuff? I typed it, man. I type it. <laughs> I can't remember if the I goes before the E or how many E's there are. I'm bad at typing and have no code completion sometimes. Anyways, I feel for people. Uh, it's also very long on the screen. I don't know. Uh, but let's not try to, to, to like go through the whole issue. I mean, I think Yuri's question is like, how, you know, this has been a known issue for a long, long time, some languages, and then, you know, the natives are getting restless and that there's like, you know, people file issues frequently about this. And we've kind of concluded that we should add something, but that we haven't made progress. Ted, I think you're yeah. accurately saying that like, there's basically resourcing issues where doing this, it seems like a simple change because conceptually it is, but like, it does require a bunch of rollout care because of these issues that we're bringing up. So I think the question is, what's the next step? I mean, and I, I would rather not, if possible, get into the discussion, the PR discussion in this call or whatever, but I mean, we could do something where we, I mean, the opening up the PR um, without merging it uh, in most languages is a very easy thing to do. I mean, truly easy thing to do um, and could be done, you know, like without, getting everything through, opening the PRs, advertising them, soliciting comments from, from you know, implementers, uh, that sort of thing could probably be done without a lot of time investment, at least that's my two cents, and is the stuff that could be taken soon. It would also allow people who are coming in and filing these issues to see that, in fact, this is, this is like, there's something in motion. I, I don't know how you feel about it, Ted, but I think like did that stuff itself could be kind of parallelized, so to speak. So it's going to be a happy remain open for a while anyway, just to make sure people see them and, and get a chance to comment. I, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, and again, my apologies for being, uh, you know, maybe too focused on Python right now. Uh, but it's there has been a long running PR about this. We could essentially socialize it a bit more and uh, just kind of put it out there, make tracking issues in every language and um, kind of announce that it's coming. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, um, I do think what, what Yuri just said does for me around coming up with a different name for these things, uh, just to make sure we don't collide. Uh, so I think that's the final bike shed. But, but we should move on it very quickly once we've resolved that. And I think if we go with the approach of just picking a name that has a low chance of collision with anything that there's no reason why we can't get a release candidate out in every language quickly um, and get people to start binding to it. So I think it'll move very quickly once, once we do that. All right. I will, uh, I'll uh, try to get moving on that on Monday actually. So, um, and uh, the new Python API should should be out probably on Tuesday. Cool. Okay, so we've only got uh, about 12 minutes left on the call. I wanted to bring up um, another issue that I would like us to get moving on as well, which is, um, uh, sort of higher level APIs for scope management. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick just to uh, make it clear what I'm talking about. Okay, so we go into presentation mode here. So uh, it mostly comes down to uh, having both scopes and spans. So we added a sort of active span concept to open tracing uh, so that the tracer would be uh, responsible for 
managing uh, which span was active in which uh, context. And if you have some kind of context switching, whether it be threads or some async level, user land level thing, the, the tracer would be tracking that using a, span, a scope manager. So each context uh, that has a span is called a scope. And uh, you can ask the, the scope manager uh, for uh, the currently active scope and pull the span off of it. Uh, scopes have to be closed when they're done. Um, and that doesn't always necessarily line up with a span being finished because you may be moving spans from context to context. So you may uh, uh, make a span active in one scope, then uh, close that scope, move the span to another scope, so on and so forth. So it seems that at a lower level, um, there is a need for, for this extra concept of a scope manager. Um, but if you see here, uh, the amount of code you have to write, it's not totally onerous. Um, this is just two simple functions, start work, which uh, uh, makes an active span in a scope, puts a tag on it, and then you finish it in another function. So you pull off the active scope, maybe do a log, and then close it. Uh, if you're writing library instrumentation, framework instrumentation, uh, this usually doesn't feel too onerous because you're writing code inside of a plugin or an interceptor, and most of the code you're writing is, is really focused on, on tracing uh, this higher level concept. So that doesn't feel too bad. However, uh, or at least to me, it doesn't feel too bad. Uh, but for application developers, um, if, you're, if start work and finish work contain a lot of application code and you're, you're doing quite a bit of this, uh, it gets onerous pretty fast. Uh, it's also hard uh, to get application developers up to speed on your team because there's kind of these like extra concepts. You know, you're saying build span, start active, but you don't get a span back, you get a scope. Uh, and then um, if you make the span automatically finish when you uh, close the scope, that's nice. But now you're saying scope close at the end and you never touch the span there either. So th this adds like some cognitive load uh, that's sort of above and beyond the, the simpler model that we had initially envisioned. So if you look at a, a simpler API, uh, if you make some assumptions that you can make when you're writing application code, such as the presence of a global tracer, um, you can make this a lot more declarative, right? It's possible to create an API where you just say start a span and it's automatically made active. Uh, and then you can access it declaratively because you have access to a, a global tracer. You don't even necessarily have to track the tracer or do any kind of object, chain, object method chaining. You could just say, hey, tag the current span, log on it, and then when you're done, you can say, hey, just, just finish this thing. So I'm not proposing this precise API. I'm just proposing that it should be possible to produce an API that's, that's this simple. Um, and in order to get application developers uh, more comfortable, uh, I think as a community, we should push for, for providing some more official uh, ergonomic API, uh, if not looking like this, at least, at least something with this level of complexity. Uh, so that's, that's my pitch. Uh, I'm gonna be pushing for this. Uh, in the cross-language working group uh, starting next week as well. But I was interested if anyone had uh, comments on this at this time uh, or thoughts about uh, how to do this or any kind of experience reports uh, from working with scopes and active spans in the field. Well, I was, I have to say that um, Manu from uh, Datadog, he had mentioned uh, that he would love to see something like this as well. So I think this is something um, nice. Uh, I think it will require a little bit of testing, of course, and refactoring and all that, but I think it's, it's overall a great idea. Yeah. <clears throat> I've heard from several people who couldn't be on this call that they're very interested in something like this. Uh, so, you know, we'll have a discussion online on Gitter. But 
Um, there's also the, just the sort of general issue of, you know, do we need scope, scope managers, that kind of a thing. Um, Pavel, I know you were asking uh, about that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Are you there, Pavel? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I don't have. <laughs> no thoughts. Well, I'm writing mostly instrumentations and there I prefer to pass things explicitly around. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this really hinges on whether you're talking about instrumenting stuff in a library versus just trying to get your work done as an application developer. And these sorts of higher level abstractions, I think, make a lot of sense for the latter, where we want an easy mode uh, type of experience. But as Pavel was saying, for, you know, very uh, meticulous instrumentation or shared libraries, it probably makes more sense to avoid the globals and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think a, a side effect of, of making something like this more officious is, is to make it clear that there would be two style guides. When you're writing instrumentation, uh, there's a style guide that talks about, you know, don't presume a global tracer, right? Always take in a tracer as an option and fall back to the global tracer if they don't give you one. Um, uh, and basically you wouldn't get to use this, this cleaner API because this API makes a bunch of assumptions, essentially. Uh, the purpose of it is to hide scopes and some of those lower level complexity that, that you actually need when you're writing trickier instrumentation, but, but don't need in the most common use cases that application developers are, are, are hitting over and over again. Yeah. I would have some comments to start and finish, but tag and lock looks very nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Start span, finish span, maybe. But but the the long basically the long and short of it is can we take the scopes and scope managers and, and make that a concept that as an application developer you you never have to think about that. You're not necessarily even aware that they exist until you get into some tricky situation and then you dig into the docs and discover there's actually these lower level APIs that you could use to, to deal with those situations. I mean, maybe it's a better idea to completely leave out the start and finish and provide some API only to add metadata if there is an active span or something active. Mm. Yeah, well, let, let's have the discussion on Gitter. This is mainly, mainly just a sort of advertisement to people that, that we want to kind of get moving on this. Um, and uh, really, we should have it in a in a forum where you know people in time zones uh, that aren't this can't make it to this call uh, can participate in it but uh, i would if people have ideas about what this kind of api uh, might look like or you know if they're already working with application developers who have written something like this uh, it would be great to start uh, you know some contrib repos uh, that are experimenting with this one nice thing is i'm fairly certain we can write all of this without actually touching the tracer API um, that I think would be one of the goals. So there's a lot of room to sort of experiment with different approaches to this and contrib. Uh, I'd just like to, to, to get moving on that. Uh, one thing I want to add is when I saw this in the agenda, I thought that would be a different topic, uh, more about uh, high level APIs for specific operations like HTTP requests or database requests. So, which kind of, um, I mean, works uh, in a similar way that people often ask, like for some standard way of doing these things. Yes, I, I definitely think we need those as well, and that could get, get wrapped up in this. Uh, for example, if you see tag, where we say some tag key, some tag value, that's fine for your own custom tags, but actually, uh, you know, going and finding the constants and kind of gluing them together when you want to do something like, say, you know, uh, log an error or an exception, there are definitely, there's definitely room for, you know, higher level functions that, that do all that work for you, where you can just pass it the exception and, and not have to think about how that translates into which keys and values should be stuck onto the span. Uh, likewise for something like an HTTP request, uh, 
database request, we, we could probably make some more ergonomic calls uh, that aren't uh, creating a whole bunch of key value pairs. Yeah, another thought on this is that we, um, you know, in this discussion earlier around trace and span IDs, we would need to make a change like that in some kind of coordinated fashion across languages. I think that for some of the higher level primitives, they, they actually naturally should deviate from language to language. Like if you're working in a Ruby or Rails environment or something like that, the types of primitives that you might want for convenience are actually different than what you'd want in Go and so on and so forth. And, and that can actually make the stuff go a bit faster. I think when we have to do cross language stuff, because I think we're now dealing with like nine languages or something like that, it's a bit daunting uh, to start one of those projects knowing how much parallel work is gonna have to take place and, uh, for the stuff you already just mentioned around HTTP and things like that, that might need some coordination, but for things that are really sugar, just to make it easier to do simple things, I could imagine that happening, um, you know, in a decoupled way across languages and let language owners make those decisions independently. Yeah, totally. Um, I think another way of thinking about this is there's been a lot and lot of work of trying to figure out what is the correct low level API for tracers to bind to and that work has been slow going. It's very difficult work uh, But we're getting it feels to me getting to the the end of that and that's starting to gel up and now it's sort of time between this kind of work and uh, Things like getting span and trace identifiers out there to allow people to start building middleware and other things we're sort of moving up the stack to uh, application developer zone and things that they would like. Uh, and that world is definitely much more opinionated and nuanced. And there's room even within a single language to have more than one way to, to do this. I, I think we should probably offer some, you know, official uh, version of this at some point just to lower the cognitive overhead. But I totally anticipate, you know, in Java, there's some people who may want to do this kind of thing with annotations, some people who may want to do it using some other declarative strategy. Uh, like you said, R Ruby, uh, there's a lot of different uh, metadata magic uh, approaches to doing things. Um, and what's great about doing these as higher level APIs is like not everyone has to agree. You can have several different approaches here and they're all complementary with each other, even within the same code base. And we're basically out of time. So unless anyone has any final comments on this, uh, I would suggest we, we take these discussions to the cross-language uh, Gitter channel and continue them there. All right, good call everyone. Lovely seeing your lovely faces. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.